This is Town Square Sunday On Demand. And now, 1420 WBSM's Jim Phillips. Good morning and welcome to Town Square Sunday. I'm Jim Phillips. There was an historic election on Tuesday. Many of us are still trying to figure out what happened. Ken Manning is the chairperson of the Political Science Department at UMass Dartmouth. I imagine he might be reeling somewhat, too. Good morning, Ken. Good morning. Good to be with you. So, Ken, first of all, were you surprised by Trump's victory and the ease of the victory? Because uh, we were told uh, throughout the process, really, going to be a close election, very close. You know, you might not know for a day or two who wins. Well, that wasn't the case. Right. Um, I, I can't say I was surprised by the outcome of the election, and I was a bit surprised that we knew as soon as we did. Indeed, you know, following the returns, I, I could tell by nine o'clock kind of the which way which way the thing the, the thing was going. Um, look, going into this election, there were a lot of polls showing that it was a coin toss; it could go either way, and. You know, all the statistical models that are out there were suggesting it was, you know, as close to 50-50 as possible. You know, and in that situation, obviously, it could go either way. Um, so I, I don't think um, anyone who approached this with a, a, a fair mind would be shocked or surprised that Trump win. Well, won, I should say. But, of course, the, the fact that he won pretty decisively um, as a result of an overall real national shift in his direction, I think was a bit surprising. Now, let's step back for a moment. The reality is, is that Harris was seeking to run for what was effectively a second, what was effectively a second Democratic term uh, for an incumbent who had a 30 percent approval rating. That is a very, very steep hill to climb. And the reality is that while Harris ran a very strong campaign, raised a lot of money, outraised Trump, in fact, she ultimately, I think, couldn't distance herself from an administration that right now is extremely unpopular among the general public, and folks simply wanted a change. Well, that's true. Uh, I mean, I think, I think your premise is certainly correct. But why couldn't she distance herself to some degree? I mean, I don't think there was there were opportunities, and I don't think she grasped those opportunities. Now, I, 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 I would loyalty. agree with that. There, there were opportunities, I think, that she could have distanced herself further from uh, the Biden administration. But at the end of the day, she is the vice president, and there is only so much that she could do to to repudiate uh, an administration that she'd worked uh, in for four years, and of course. There's also the downside, potentially, of that of alienating, you know, Democratic voting groups. So, you know, she was boxed in by the fact that she was running for a second term for an unpopular incumbent. And, yeah, she could have, uh, in, in certain points of the race, put some distance between herself and Joe Biden. But she was seen as a continuation of the Biden administration policies in the country after, you know, four difficult years since um, covid uh, wanted a, a new direction. So um, I, I know there's a lot of Monday money, money morning quarterbacking going on mm -hmm. by a lot of political analysts on the left and the right. Um, and this, of course, happens after every election. The losing side goes off and tries to figure out what went wrong, and the winners, you know, uh, exult in triumph. Um, but at the end of the day, I really do think this was simply fundamental factors involving the incumbent administration, people's un uh, unhappiness with the with their economic prospects, and simply wanting to move in a new direction. Well, uh, you know, I, I, I can't disagree. Who were the voters that gave Trump, President-elect Trump, this resounding victory? Um, were they... I don't know if you can chalk it up just to, oh, it's middle America. I think it's more than <laughs> yeah, that. It's, it's, yeah, if, if actually some of the exit polls show, you know, huge shifts in his direction um, nationally. Um, now, statistically, if you break it down by demographic groups, you know, gender, race, region, income, age, et cetera, um, what, what we see is across the board there was a general shift toward Trump and fellow Republicans. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk about him making inroads with black and hi Hispanic voters. I think that the, the data seems to suggest that that's true. 
Um, he's certainly made strides with white working class voters. You can see that here in, in Fall River, New Bedford, where, you know, you're seeing a lot of Republican yard signs in, in towns that are historically considered Democratic leaning. And a lot of votes. Um, I understand. Uh, I, sure. read, I read today in Bristol County, which includes New Bedford, Fall River, Taunton and surrounding towns. Uh, Trump won in, in, in Bristol County. That's an amazing feat. Right. It's, it's extraordinary. Right. Um, so, so you can see these general shifts um, in Trump and Republicans' directions uh, in, in a variety of different spheres. And that really suggests, again, a general dissatisfaction with the way things are. Um, and, and in that way, of course, again, it's something that I think uh, the Democrats simply couldn't ultimately overcome. Everyone has promised to work for a peaceful transition, including uh, Vice President Harris, who made a concession speech on Wednesday. If that happens, it will be in contrast to what happened in 2021. Um, but uh, I think Donald Trump tends to play nice when he wins. <laughs> well, what Trump did on January 6th is just reprehensible, despicable, fomenting violence and, of course, the, the ransacking of the U.S. Capitol is, is one of the darkest stains in, in 20th century or 21st century history, in American history. Um, the Democrats, of course, would have no part of that. And, and you know, the, the, the Biden-Harris administration encouraging something like that, frankly, is inconceivable. So, yes, there will be a peaceful, reasonable transition. Um, uh, they, the Democrats will hand off the baton to the Trump administration. Now, of course, what the Trump administration does, we obviously don't know. A lot of speculation. We know from Trump's past um, that he has a, a, you know, a, a callous disregard for the law in many instances. He's shown authoritarian tendencies. Um, uh, you know, he's vulgar. You know, the, the list goes on and on. Uh, but, but we'll just have to see how things go. I think right now, uh, the the administration is bracing for uh, an incoming administration that has, um, uh, uh, like I said, a, a callous disregard for proper procedure, and and I think they're going to to try to prepare, prepare accordingly. What happens next to Kamala Harris? Great question. Um, she'll obviously be uh, looking for a job, so to speak. Um, I, I think that she is going to uh, think about. A run in 28. After any election, there's always, uh, you know, jockeying on both sides potentially to see who could be a, a candidate next round. Right? Trump can't run, we know, in 2028. So we're going to have an interesting situation in the next presidential election. Both the Democrats and the Republicans will have an open field, and uh, I think Harris will face competition, perhaps from a fellow Californian, Gavin Newsom. Uh, others may step forward, and, and certainly. Um, on the Republican side, right, people are going to think about J.D. Vance um, as the incumbent vice president. Uh, but other Republicans may, of course, want to challenge him for the nomination. So um, it's, it's, you know, just two days after the election, uh, we need to let the dust settle, and particularly after the midterm elections, too. So historically, parties tend to really, or candidates, I should say, within the parties, start to get serious about who's going to run once we have a, a, a clear idea of what the electoral and political landscape looks like after the next round of federal elections, which will, of course, be in November of 26, which, which senators, governors win, lose, who's looking for a, 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 an effort to step to climb up the next rung on the ladder, etc. So right now we're going to let the dust settle, and then in 26 I think you'll see the parties start to get serious and, and candidates start coming forward. You're listening to Town Square Sunday. I'm Jim Phillips. My guest is Professor Ken Manning, who's chair of the political science department at UMass Dartmouth. Ken, what does the Democratic Party have to do now? This obviously, uh, there's going to be some soul searching about the party, the direction it's heading, and how does it get back some of that blue collar vote? Yeah, and that's something I think the Democrats certainly have to think about. Look, in every election, there's a bit of change, and there's some continuity as well. In, in this election, we've seen some real shifts among the, the Republican Party coalition in a way that has make it, made inroads with historically Democratic groups. The real question is, is, are these shifts in terms of permanent reattachments to the Republican Party, 
or is it really just kind of uniquely driven by Trump and his bombastic, uh, at times outrageous style? We don't know. Um, and we're going to have to look at the data over, over time. Do we see, for example, an increase in the number of people who are registering as Republicans versus Democrats? We also know, too, that the parties have shifted on the number of issues. For example, this was the first time since 1980s that the Republican Party didn't run on an expressly pro-life platform. Um, the Democrats increasingly attract a high education uh, a coalition of voters, um, uh, and they turn out in very high rates, and that, that can have real impact in terms of midterm elections. So after each election, I think that there's this assessment of, you know, what do we need to do better? And the Democrats clearly are going to have to do that. But there's also kind of a question of, you know, how has our party fundamentally changed? And the reality is the Republican Party today is a very different organization than it was when, when Reagan was president. And the Democratic Party, of course, too, is also different than, than what it was 40 years ago. And, and each party will make its adjustments. They'll adjust by tweaking their, their messages on issues. They'll adjust by taking on new issues and, and you know, casting aside others. And new candidates will come onto the scene inevitably who attract to di- to diff- have attractions to different types of voters. So one of the interesting things about American politics is it's never static. It's constantly changing and churning. And so both parties, I think, will go into the next election with slightly different coalitions. So President-elect uh, Trump says, uh, he said it during the campaign, I should say, he'll close the border end the wars in Ukraine and Gaza, and lower inflation. It sounds like a very busy first few months, president-elect. To be sure, I anticipate that there will be a a, a lot of announcements in the early days of administration of policy changes. That's often the case. I think it will be especially so with Trump. Um, Now, one thing you have to step back, you know, Trump, Trump says a lot of things that are frankly false. They're lies. And he's bombastic, a lot of hyperbole. So, so you all you have to kind of separate the the signal from the noise at time dealing with Trump, especially so. That's the case with all politicians. But he's you know he's especially known as a BS artist, frankly. Uh, now, does that mean that he's not going to follow through on on some of the things he said? No, I, I believe that he will. But 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 just because he said it on the campaign trail doesn't mean that it actually turns into policy. How much of that happens? Um, how much of it's blocked by the courts? How much of it uh, meets a, a not particularly interested Congress? Um, all of those things remain to be seen. Does America simply not want to vote for a woman for president? What's your thought? Yeah, there's that? speculation on that. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I, I, I suspect that there is some element of that, some element of gender bias in the vote. Um, but is that the key reason or a main reason why Harris lost or Clinton before her? I don't think so. I, I, I think, for example, if Biden had been on the, the Biden's name had been on the ballot day before yesterday, Democrats would have lost much more handily than, than they did this time around. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, I think um, uh, Harris is going to end up with probably around 48 percent of the vote. Trump's going to end up around 51 percent. So you're talking about a three percentage point race which you know, um, is a fairly decent margin, not a landslide by any means, but certainly not by a whisker. Um, if if the, the Democrats had a man at the top of the ticket versus a woman, would the gap have been any different? Um, maybe slightly. Would it have been enough to change the outcome of the race? Ab- absolutely not. I do think there is some lingering um, uh, gender bias uh, in terms of, of voting for a president. But, but I don't think ultimately that is a reason why Harris lost. She ran an excellent campaign. She raised a lot of money. She um, uh, put together an excellent organization, um, uh, and she came up short. But ultimately that's because I think uh, she was tied to an administration that was just simply unpopular. And it wasn't gender that ultimately doomed her election bid. Okay. Um, well, your students have lived through this campaign. Uh, what are they saying as uh – in days after the election? Well, students, of course, were uh, generally quite supportive of Harris's candidacy. So I'm, I'm, um, uh, my experience is that there, a lot of them are disappointed. Of course, they're not monolithic, right? There are Republican students as well, and sure. I'm sure that they're happy with the outcome of this. Um, 
you know, every student uh, at the collegiate level that experiences a presidential election is doing so often for the first time um, as, as a voter. Um, and, and so, you know, it's a new experience for them. And one of the things about following politics, if you choose a team, you're going you're gonna to be disappointed, right? Um, uh, and that's just the nature of politics. There will be great moments of victory and triumph that are joyous, and there will be times of sadness and defeat. And you just got to, you know, p- pick yourself up, lick your wounds, dust, dust yourself off, and go back into the, to the, the, the arena and, and fight it out again. And that's just the nature of, of politics. So I, I come back to this question because I just, I just don't have an answer, and maybe you do, although you probably don't. Uh, guilty verdicts, misogynistic language, racist language, a hateful rally at Madison Square Garden, leader of an insurrection. Why didn't any of that matter to the people who voted for Donald Trump? Well, I think it does matter to people who voted, but there was enough who it didn't matter to aligned with people who are frankly indifferent to it. They had more votes on their side, and, and, you know, and people definitely are mystified. How could you vote for someone? All, all that you said is absolutely true. Tr- Trump is a really a despicable person. Um, but people were willing to vote for them, and they were willing to vote for them because uh, partisanship, because maybe they like that. Uh, you know, maybe there's something that, that they're attracted to about that awfulness. And then there's others who simply voted for it simply because they're unhappy with the status quo. And in a two-party system, your choice is a binary one, right? Yep. It's either or. And, and if you're unhappy with the status quo, you may not like your alternative – but but it's different than the way things are, and I think that that, um, along with partisanship, along with the the folks who frankly like the the reprehensible behavior, um, all, all of those combined and together were 50 percent of the vote. But but don't but don't lose sight of the fact that there was 48 percent, which is darn near half the country, who chose the other side. And so um, I think one can't be too dispirited. By um, by the by the fact that yeah, 51 percent voted for all that awfulness, but there's a large part who didn't, and of course they form the opposition and they play an important role going forward. And then there's James Carville, who once said, "It's the economy, stupid." Right. And well, that and the that economy, played a role of course, too. is and the the economy. Um, you know, it, the the quote unquote the economy means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, right? To to academics and scholars, it's things like GDP and productivity numbers and you know statistics and, and data. But to the average American voter, the quote unquote the economy really is their their economic well being. And a lot of people went going into this election look back to where their life was pre COVID before 2020, and times are tougher, right? Uh, prices have gone up. The the rent is higher, and uh, the price of a car automobile is higher, um, and their paycheck may have gone up a little bit, uh, but certainly not to the same extent that prices have. And so, uh, so the quote unquote economy is is a lot more than just you know increases in the GDP and how the Dow Jones is doing today. It's really for most voters how their overall economic well being is, and, and in the broad scheme of history. The country is is in a very different place uh, after COVID, and in in many ways it's not as good of a place, right? It's harder. Life is harder now for many people than what it was before COVID. And Biden, frankly, isn't to blame to that. And Trump, frankly, is not the hero or the the, the Superman that's going to rescue us out of this difficult time period. The reality is is that the, the, the pandemic was a key before and after moment in American history. And for a lot of folks, the pandemic has left them worse off. And they're unhappy. The mood of the country is, un, is sour. Uh, and, and folks wanted a new direction. Uh, I think at the end of the day, that's the key takeaway from this election. Professor Ken Manning is my guest. He's the chair of the UMass Dartmouth Political Science Department. Thank you again, Ken, for joining us. I'm sure, I'm sure we'll be talking again. You bet. Take care. Town Square Sunday will continue in just a moment. Don't go away.